The Tower of London, one of the most famous fortresses in the world. What better place than under these battlements to interview the 997th Commander of the Night Watch from Game of Thrones? I asked legendary actor James Cosmo about his life and career in over 200 movies and television dramas, spanning seven decades, and his attitude to his craft which has made him one of the most recognised and best-loved actors of this age. Turkish Tea Talk with Alex Salmond on TRT World. Well, James Cosmo, I mean, we're here at the Tower of London, and I'm just wondering, how would uh, Jour Mormont, the 997th commander of the Night Watch, would have been able to defend these battlements? I think he'd have done very well. I think he'd have appreciated the history of that place and uh, yes he would be very happy to to walk up and down these walls and uh, and see off and his the, robes what, what were they called the white walkers oh. and, and all those dangerous things. ones yeah absolutely <laughs> perfect location isn't it i mean the things like you know game of thrones i'm interested you know when you get a script or when you get a part yeah. have you any idea that something like Game of Thrones is going to be kind of the all-time high for television successes. I'll tell you how that happened, Alex. I get uh, sent through some sides, as they call them, like three pages, four pages of dialogue to go on tape for this American series that they were making. And usually uh, when you do that, you go into the casting director's office, you've got them the thing there and you just read off the line that's it but I read this speech and it was it was when Lord Mormont is uh, welcoming if you like the new recruits to the Night Watch and he tells them that they're all a bunch of horrible people and they're robbers and thieves and the lowest of the low <laughs> but you are joining this group of people whose life is dedicated to protecting the people inside the wall against all the malevolence outside and it was a really, really good speech. It went on forever. But something in the back of my head said, um, no, you've really got to make a good job of this, you know? So I worked with my wife, Annie, for that evening and, and got the, all these words off. And uh, next day I went into the casting director, went in, they, just like here, you know, there's a camera set up and I, uh, they said, do you want it? I said, yeah, let's go. And boom, three weeks later or whatever, I got a, an email from George R. R. Martin saying, saying uh, Dear Lord Commander, uh, welcome to Game of Thrones. So but when you got to Dear Lord Commander, you knew I you had thought, the part. I thought I might have, <laughs> um, which was amazing. Um, but nobody ever realised how big it was going to be. I mean, it was a big production, but you have big productions that only last one season, you know, and, and that's it. I said to David Benioff, um, the, one of the producers and writers, uh, I said, do you think we're going to get a second series out of this? And he went, I don't know. I just don't know. My goodness. It just hit a chord with the public. So when you're in a huge series like that, yeah. uh, and your character, John Mormon, gets yeah. bumped off. I, mean, yeah. I don't know how that upstart Jon Snow got on, but nonetheless, is it... Really, everyone did get bumped off. Well, yeah. it must be a bit of disappointment for you. Oh, no! <laughs> Just no, when I, I was enjoying it. I always knew, because I, I go um, steelhead fly fishing in uh, Washington State, and I've got an old friend of mine, Bo, that, that lives there. And uh, I told him, I'm in this show. And he said, James, I'm going to read the books. I'm going to read them. And so the first year we're out there fishing and he, 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 he shouts, he said, hey, James, he said, I'm reading Game of Thrones. You know, the, he said, you're still there, kid. You're still there. <laughs> well, two years later, we're there and he said, James, they're drinking beer out of your skull. <laughs> so I knew it was coming, but that was fine. I'd been in the first three seasons and, you know, I, it would have been, you know, I guess it would have been nice to carry on. But three seasons is a lot of work and you want to move on. Well, let me take you back to the beginning of your, your life as an actor. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, you're a working class lad in Clydeside. You're yeah. born Dunbarton, but yeah. you moved to Clyde Bank and that area in the 
industrial belt of, yeah. of Scotland. Yeah. And effectively, at the age of 17, 18, you've got a choice. You, you can either get a steady job in the shipyards or ship yeah. breaking, I think it yeah. was, yeah. or you can come <clears> to <throat> London and try your hand as an actor. Yeah. Now, I'm really interested because your father was a jobbing actor in London. You yeah. knew yeah. how difficult yeah. it was going to be, and, but you made that choice. Yeah, yeah. Um, we were brought up in, in Darmuir, just outside Clyde Bank, up a close, you know, same as everybody else. I still believe that I had a, a, a very privileged upbringing. There was very little money around and everyone worked very hard trying to, you know, rebuild Clyde Bank and the, and the, the country from after the war. Um, but the sense of community and, and warmth and a feeling of security was overwhelming. It was wonderful. When I was eight, um, my father, as you say, was a jobbing actor and he was in a, a very long, I think it ran for four years, uh, there was a, a stage comedy um, called Sailor Beware and he was in it and he contacted my mum and said bring the, the kids down to London and uh, so he sent her up some money. I, I don't know what the dynamics between them were but anyway they weren't together. Um, so he sent my mum some money and instead of getting the coach or the, the bus or the train, um, she went out the first day and she bought a gypsy uh, bow top wagon, you know the canvas wagon? And then the next day she went down and she bought a, a, a grey, a, a horse, his name was Bobby, she bought him from the fish market. And we all piled into this, this wagon and travelled down to London in it. And we got to um, St Albans some weeks later. Some weeks later, uh, and then I stayed, uh, my mum and dad stayed together for three years. My friends, my dad's friends were actor Sean Connery was there, O'Toole was there, and it was like, what is this, you know? It's a, I remember sitting outside, Peter had a, a, a beautiful house. This is Peter O'Toole of uh, Lawrence of Arabia fame. Yeah, so you can imagine a, a young boy of eight being around all these incredible people, you know? Sean Connery, the first James Bond, you know. I played cricket with him on the Hampstead Heath when he was, he was in the, the chorus line. Did he beat you? Of South Pacific, I can't remember. Um, but yeah, they were all, they were all there. So I had three years of seeing that, you know, and I remember as a little boy going with my father uh, into the theater, you know, and just sitting there. And it really was the smell of that and listening in the tannoy to the, the crowd and then his call and, Ever, all those things, you know, so that had a, a huge effect on me. But then at 11, we moved back up to Glasgow, just my mum and my sister and I. And I, I went to Clydebank High School, which was an extraordinary school. In Clydebank, deprived, hard-working, rough old area. Always remember the teachers wore their long cloaks and sometimes their mortar board. It's the graduation robes from university. Yes, but they wore them every day. <laughs> and the discipline was incredibly strict. Um, but they turned out some fabulous people. Yeah, I suppose you would say you were fortunate, we would say you were talented. You came right into the golden age of television. You got parts in Dr yeah. Finlay's case books, you were in the, the Sweeney. But, and, and that was a great career, but you were hitting perhaps a bit of a, a pause <laughs> or an yeah. idea yeah. in your 50s. And then one night you got a, a surprise phone call. Tell us about yeah, that. Yeah, well, I was 46 and I'd met Mel Gibson, what they call a general meeting. You know, like they, he might be making a movie over here. He wants to meet some people. It's uh, Scottish people, whatever. And so I, I went along. I spent... 10 minutes with him and we, uh, oh, I always remember he said uh, hi I'm Mel Gibson how are you he said uh, do you want a drink and I said uh, what hi go on <laughs> and he, he pours me a whiskey and I thought oh he's not having one oh well and uh, so a wee, a wee dram and we he played me some music he said what do you think of this music it was sort of um, sort of music that was actually in the film and I said yeah that's very impressive stuff very emotive and he, so with this very short meeting it was great to meet a big film star, terrific. You forget all about it, forget it. So I, my wife Annie was working at the BBC, she was a breadwinner, I hadn't been working for a while, and we got a baby, um, who's now a great big lump, but we had a baby. And 
he was just months old. And we were living in this wee flat in Twickenham. Um, uh, one bedroom flat, we had a futon that we all slept on, including the baby, which was lovely. And we had a rocking chair that we'd borrowed from Annie's mum and a TV. That was about it. But we were, we were fine, we were, we were good. But the one treat of the week was a curry, because I love curries, coming from Glasgow, of course you do. But um, so I'm sitting down, there's this lovely big curry, you know, and I thought, yes, here we go. And the phone rings. So I, I said to Annie, ah, oh, that's Dominic, my best pal at that time, who's passed, God bless him. But um, I said, that, that'll be Dominic calling me from the pub to come out for one before it shuts. I said, tell him I'm just having a curry and I'm watching a film, but I'll see him tomorrow at lunchtime. And she went, okay, fine. And she went away and she lifted the phone. You see, it's in the same room and I'm watching the film and I'm eating the curry. And she says, hello, yes. Uh huh. Oh, right. She said, would you hang on a minute? I went, curry. <laughs> and she said, oh. put a hand over the phone. She said, it's Mel Gibson. I went, ugh. I said, it's that Dominic was a terrible practical joker. And I said, ugh, it's, ugh, come here. I said, hello. Like that, as aggressive as that. I went, oh. And this voice said, uh, hello, Jimmy, uh, it's Mel. I went, aye, yeah, <laughs> who? It really is Mel Gibson, you know. And he, he said, I've been watching your show reel. And he said, uh, will you come and play Campbell, the father for me? And I said, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'd love to. He said, great. He said, uh, I'll see you next week. Goodbye. So, so this is that Campbell was Boom. in Braveheart. In Braveheart. Uh, yeah. So winner of whatever, six, seven, forget the number of Oscars. Yeah, uh, I don't know, this, six, I think. Yeah. This extraordinary uh, yeah. film, yeah. which uh, yeah. many people say reignited the, the national movement in Scotland. And, Indeed. And your, your character, Campbell, was a... Uh, a, a guy who uh, was inspired uh, because he had lived his life under oppression, and he, he, yeah. he, he you have a your death speech. It, yeah. It's one of the most quoted as you're dying. You yeah. say, I, I want to think about that for a second. You're yeah. doing a death scene like that. I yeah. mean, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, and you've got something sticking out of you, and somebody's got a hot poker or something. I mean, it's very interesting, <laughs> you know, in that death scene. It just shows um, what Mel Gibson was like as a director mm -hmm. and an actor being both, um, that it, it, we just had lunch and we were going to shoot the death scene. And uh, we were walking to the set and he said, uh, Jimmy, he said, uh, tell me, he said, what's the cheapest thing on this set? And I said, the cheapest thing? I said, I've got no idea. What, what are you talking about? He said, it's the film and that camera. Use as much as you like, which was a great thing because he was, all of a sudden he was Meaning saying, to keep doing it you can you got do it right. that 20 times if you want. Nobody's going to say anything. And many because times I've did said you do it? Two. <laughs> it's not of fast. course. Not fast. Because you relax and you get into it and it's, and it's great. And the only reason we did it a second time was because, on, on my big close up, because Mel was a, is and was a terrible That's practical joker. And uh, he said, right, we're going to shoot that one more time. And I'm lying on, on, uh, on uh, Brendan Gleeson's lap, you know, with all this sort of stuff. And Brendan, God bless him, he's, you know, his lips trembling and everything. So he's the right action. And I'm, so eventually I expire and I close my eyes and I'm, I'm waiting for somebody to shout, cut, you know? <laughs> and I can hear Brendan doing this and I think, oh, he's sobbing, you know, sobbing. <laughs> And it goes on, and then I look up, and Brendan has got a cl red clown's nose on <laughs> his thing. This was for the, the gag reel at the end, you know. Um, so that's the only reason we did it a second time. And when, when it came to the premiere, yeah. uh, you, you were, I think you were filming elsewhere, but you, you dropped everything. When you're part of a very successful movie, there's a sort of idea that if, if people cast you in something else, then that will make their movie. It's a sort of logistics thing, you know? So I got asked to do this film called Emma, you know, a Jane Austen thing. Tights, me and tights. Anyway, I met the director, Doug McGrath. He didn't tell me anything about the film. He wasn't interested. He just wanted to talk about Braveheart. So I'm down in the West Country and uh, filming Emma with Ewan McGregor and Gwyneth Paltrow. 
And uh, so I had to be at the McRoberts Centre in Stirling for the premiere on Saturday night. I said, guys, you've got to let me, you know, give me the, make sure I can get up there. And they tried and they, they said, well, get this big uh, scene that we're doing. Everyone's in it, you're in it. We can't, we just can't let you go, you know. And I phoned my wife and I said, we can't go to the, the premiere. This is, ah, and things. And she said, oh, that's okay. Don't worry about it. But I knew she was disappointed. And so I sat and thought, hang on, I'm, I'm making a, a good living here. So I phoned her back and I said, Annie, get us a plane. And she said, what? I said, get us a plane. So a few hours later, she phoned back and said, I've got a twin engine plane. It's going to take off from um, Seven Oaks, just up the road from us. So up there, into the plane, flew up to Glasgow, went to the premiere, had the most fantastic time. And so eventually, about two o'clock in the morning, this is the interesting bit, two o'clock in the morning, Annie said, we better get going, get you, get you back home. So there are cars waiting and we get in the car and we're driving to Glasgow. And in those days, nobody had mobile phones, but the guy had a, a car phone and it rang. And he lifted it up and he said, oh, here, he said, it's for you. I thought, what, what's gone wrong? So I lifted the phone and it said, um, this is uh, Strat at that time, Strathclyde Police. We believe you've got a, a, a private plane flying to London uh, tonight. I said, yeah, well, in about half an hour, whatever. Uh, is it, what, what's wrong? They said, um, we've got a human heart that oh, needs goodness. to get down to London and we can't wait. In those days, they just couldn't wait. And he said, would you be willing to take the heart down? And I said, absolutely, yeah. Well, within about 10 minutes, two police motorcyclists came up the motorway like that on either side of us and there was an ambulance behind them. And they always remember the, the police guy was like that and he went like that to the driver and he took off like woof. And we went screaming down the motorway. They contacted the plane and they gave us this big yellow box and it sat up between Annie and I all the way to London. And this, the, the police and the ambulance were waiting for us at, at the airport. So God willing, on the Braveheart premiere yeah. at Stirling Castle and your attendance there yeah. saved somebody's life. Yeah. They, they might be walking about London You never now, know, as you never result. know. Let's hope so. Yeah. But for you, Braveheart, I mean, it brought you to a kind of second phase of your career because yeah. it, it was the ultimate blockbuster, Hollywood blockbuster. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then you, you went to Train Spotting, to Troy, to the yeah. Chronicles of Narnia. Yeah. Now, what I'm interested in is because you were in Braveheart, other people planning other huge movies say, we better have Cosmic. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. They tend to think that if you've been part of something very successful, then maybe your input. Uh, would be appreciated in, in their project, you know. It's great to be in a big show because it does have a knock-along knock effect in your career. I say we make him wait a little longer! Uh, uh, another interesting point is that, I mean, obviously you play a senior figure because uh, it's that stage of your career. Yeah. There's still a huge range. I mean, you're, you know, in, uh, let's see, in, uh, in Jack Ryan, you know, a, a, a Russian... Uh, uh, spy master, how yeah. the folk knocked off, but in yeah. the Chronicles of Narnia, you're Santa Claus. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, there's quite yeah. a contrast between, yeah. I mean, yeah. the, you both got beards, but apart from that, yeah. one, yeah. one guy's killing folk yeah. and the other guy's Santa. Yeah, although I didn't have a beard in Jack Ryan, which was a bit of a shock for oh, me. Oh, well, they wouldn't recognise um, me. <laughs> yeah, th that's one of the joys of, of my profession, you know, that, that you have that, you know, every time you go to a new job, it's a different job, it's a different character. You know, the dynamics with, with your fellow actors and your, your directors and the crew, it's all, always different, it's always fresh. And how about the, you know, the really big names? I, I mean, are they, you know, are, are some of them prima donnas and some of them are nice as you like? Uh, uh, or does it just depend on the individual? Is there, is there no great set formula? There isn't a set formula. I've, fo I've found in general that the, the, the bigger the star, the more grounded they seem to be. I don't know, maybe the, maybe they're used to that position and, and feel very assured, you know, but um, yeah, I, I think people that have got maybe anxiety about their work or whatever tend to be the ones that, that rub up against you a wee bit. But in general, I, I've been very lucky with the people I've worked with. 
And, and think about you know the most recent part of your career. You moved yeah. from kind of Hollywood blockbusters, individual movies to yeah. these mega television series like yeah. Sons of Anarchy, yeah. Game of Thrones, obviously yeah. Jack Ryan, which yeah. is you know one of the more recent ones. Yeah. Uh, that's I mean that I mean, it must be great when you get offered that sort of part because you say, well, that's not just a one-off. I'll be I'll be doing I'll be doing a number of episodes. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, funny when you say Sons of Anarchy because I got a phone call from my agent in America and. and she said, do you want to be in Sons of Anarchy? And I immediately thought, tattoos? They'll give me a Harley Davidson. I'll be there. I'm made for this. And I said, absolutely. I'm on the plane tomorrow. I'm going. And then I read the script, and I'm playing an Irish priest. <laughs> All I got was a Prius, a little battered Prius. And, and how did you get a part like, uh, well, like Jack Ryan? I mean, yeah. I mean it's a big thing to get, oh. you go through stages and stages of... General process is usually that your, your agent gets approached and then you, you go on tape, you meet casting directors, you, you <clears throat> go on tape again and then you've got to go through the, who the producers are, then the network and everything. It's a big, long process <clears throat> to get there. I got a phone call from my wonderful agent, Olivia, and she said, I, I have just had an interesting phone call. I said, oh, yeah. She said, um, have you heard of Jack Ryan? I said, yeah, 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 yeah books, yeah. She said, yeah, this is a series for Amazon. Um, that, that it's, it's season three. It's been, because I don't watch much. She said, it's a really huge series. And I said, oh, right, OK. She said, now, this part, it's a Russian um, Luka Gotcharov, and he, he's right through the whole thing. Uh, she said, the interesting thing is, James, that the message from production is the producers want you, the network wants you, but most importantly, John Krasinski wants you. <laughs> and to my, for my sins, I said, who's John Krasinski? She said, he's the superstar that plays Jack Ryan. I went, oh, I thought that's weird ended up filming in Budapest and I'd done a few scenes and then I had to do it. I was doing a scene with, with uh, John, John Krasinski, and um, there he appears. Lovely, one of the nicest people you could ever meet. A really lovely, lovely man. Anyway, he comes in and he's, he's a big, tall guy, handsome looking man. Anyway, we're on a wee break and he said, uh, do you know, he said, do you know, Jimmy, how, how you got this part? And I went, I would love to know. <laughs> there was only water in the syringe. We have much to discuss and little time. He said, what it was, was um, he and his wife had been... Uh, Emily Blunt. Yes, because this character, Luka Gotcharov, holds the whole thing together. He said, but who do we get to play Luka Gotcharov? And Emily said, without hesitation, oh, James Cosmo should play that. I have never met Emily Blunt. I still haven't met Emily Blunt. Isn't that the strangest thing? Just how fate says here. James, just thinking about your career, I mean, you've, you've made films with some of the most famous uh, actors and actresses in, uh, yeah. in, the, in the planet. Yeah. I mean, looking at that, the, if you think about people who light up the screen, you know, yeah. I, I'm interested in this, this aura that some great stars have, that they look, pretty ordinary folk yeah. probably backstage yeah. but as soon as they go on the stage or in front of the camera they, there's some sort of demonic yeah. energy comes out of them they light yeah. up the screen yeah. who, who, would, who would the ones you would point to who had that great great attitude? I, although I never met him I would say Albert Finney had that Sean had that Sean Connery um, and Peter O'Toole yeah. you know when you when you saw him in Lawrence of Arabia my goodness it was just extraordinary and he, as I say, he was a great friend of my dad's. And when I filmed Troy with him, and he didn't know I was his, my dad's son yeah. until the makeup man told him. And um, he said to me then, he said, you know, he said, um, we're out here in Mexico. He said, the television is awful. He said, so my son sends me videos of um, my favorite programs. I said, what's that? He said, uh, Dad's Army. He said, I <laughs> love that. It's so funny. The great and comedy he, series yeah. about, the, about the war, yeah. yeah. I said, was it my dad? And he said, yes. And I cried and cried and cried. A word of advice, young actors, people starting out in life. I mean, 
you know, you've had a, a long, hugely successful career, but you've had your ups and downs, yeah, like, yeah. like we all have. Yeah. Many words for the, the next generation as they, as they start out in their chosen field, what, what, yeah. what, what the best thing to do is. In any chosen field, yeah. It's terribly tough for young people now. When I, when I was young, it was, things were a bit clearer. But it's, it's very difficult with advancing technology and, and, and the way the world is changing, you know, for the better and for the worse. Um, to be brave, don't be frightened of that thing that you're frightened of, because it's just an illusion. Be brave. Get out there and do what your heart tells you to do. Great advice, James. And we wouldn't send you away empty-handed, so... I brought along a Turkish tea set for you. Oh, oh wow! Oh wow! Look at that! And it'll keep you out of mischief if you're drinking tea. No, but uh, yeah, it would, I guess. It would. That's lovely, Alex. Thank James you Cosmo, so much. Thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Lovely to talk with you. Wow, that's gorgeous.